Great, thank you very much. Good evening or good afternoon. This is Steve Conklin, Vice Chair of Dr. Cog and Chair of the Work Session for Wednesday, July 6th, 2022. And Melinda, can we have the agenda on screen? Fantastic. You'll see a summary of the June 1st, 2020 board work session uh, information as attachment A. Uh, I don't know if there are any questions on that, but that is uh, in the packet. Uh, and actually, before that, do we have any public comment? I apologize. Well, is there any public wishing to comment? I will take that as a no. Uh, again, as I mentioned, the uh, summary of our last meeting is in the packet. And Melinda, if I can get the agenda back on screen. Thank you very much. With that, we will move into our only item on the agenda, the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan, 2050 RTP Greenhouse Gas, GHG analysis update. Uh, before I turn it over to, to Mr. Rieger, just want to thank staff for all of their work on this. This is something we're obviously seeing multiple times because it's a work in progress. There's a lot going on as we try to kind of figure out what's what's going on with that. So we appreciate everybody's attention to this uh, uh, big item. And, and Jacob, thank you so much for your work. With that, I will turn it over to Jacob Rieger. Jacob. Yes, well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon, everyone. I was going to apologize because I'm the reason that you have to have a meeting two days after July 4th. Um, but it is important, and I appreciate folks being here today. Uh, give me just a second. Sorry, of course, my screen froze as soon as I started sharing. My apologies. Give me just a moment here. But if you're working through that, I will just briefly thank everybody for being here because Jake is correct. Uh, we're fresh off of a holiday, but I appreciate everybody making the time to be a part of the meeting tonight. So thank you all. Okay. Sorry, Mr. Chair, this worked for the last meeting, but of course I had technical difficulties. <clears throat> Give me just one more moment here. Let me see if I can get this fixed. It's also our first meeting since the Avalanche one. So I'll stall by <laughs> congratulating the Avalanche. How many people were at the parade, the rally? I'm sure I wasn't the only one. Okay, let's give that a try. Looks like you all are seeing that in presentation mode. Yes, we are. Okay, thank you for your patience. Let's hop right into it. Move some things out of the way. All right, so yes, we did want to give you an update, um, you know, sort of a, the next update on where we are with the greenhouse gas analysis work related to our 2050 regional transportation plan. Um, so really we're at the point where we're starting to kind of build a framework of what the potential set of strategies is going to look like to meet the emission reduction targets that are in the state greenhouse gas rule. Um, so wanted to give you sort of a, a look at kind of where we're at um, and where we think we're going. So you've seen a version of this before. I'm not going to belabor the point on this particular slide, but just a couple key takeaways from here that really shows our overall process and framework for the technical analysis that we've been doing. Um, one is that these things are building on each other, um, these kind of steps one through four that we've articulated in this flow chart. And really the main takeaway is just, you know, it doesn't, it's not gonna take just one or two or three things um, in order for us to meet, the reduction, to meet the emission reduction targets. It's gonna take 10 or 15 or 20 things um, in terms of strategies, concepts, specific measures, um, everything that we're looking at in order to get there, it's really going to take a lot of things to get us there. Um, and I think that's reflected in the sort of complexity of the topics even on, on this slide. So um, just some key strategies and concepts. Um, <clears throat> we've talked about this in previous meetings. One of the first things we did was representing what we call programmatic or non-project specific um, investments from the 2050 plan in our focus uh, travel model. Um, you'll recall me saying in previous meetings that the rule defines uh, the baseline, um, the baseline for our analysis. <clears throat> and the baseline 
is the plan as, as it was adopted back in April of 2021 and as it was modeled at the time of adoption. And typically in our modeling for our regional transportation plan, we include, of course, the major multimodal projects, but we don't um, in the past have not included the non-project specific programmatic investments, what, what I call the connective tissue of our transportation system. But they're really important. Uh, they're really important for the operation and maintenance of our system. And they're important from a greenhouse gas perspective. And so a lot of the work we've been doing is to try and quantify and include um, the GHG benefits of those programmatic investments within our technical analysis. We've talked a little bit about uh, strategic changes to the 2050 plans project investment mix. Um, and I'll talk more about that in this presentation again, uh, from the lens of the GHG rule and what can we do in this multi part strategy, as I said, it's going to take many things to get us there. Uh, so one of the things is looking at the plan and the major project mix. Uh, from a GHG perspective and seeing what we can do to, um, you know, kind of help from a project perspective to get us there as well. Um, we've talked a little bit about near term land use forecast adjustments uh, based on observed residential density increases um, between 2019 and what's what's going to be built by 2025. Um, so again, if the real world is developing um, differently than our original forecast, can we, you know, can we reasonably and transparently include that in our work? Um, we've talked about telework rates adjustments in our travel model, um, and I'll show you that on the next table. Um, but obviously, telework is part of um, part of the strategy. And then um, we talked at your regular board meeting um, in June. We talked about mitigation measures um, and had a discussion about mitigation measures. So we'll have the next iteration of that conversation. I'll show you the proposed mitigation measure concepts that we're looking at. So let me start here. I want to say a couple things about this table. First, there's a lot of numbers and there's a lot of math on this table, and we're not going to do a lot of math. Uh, late on a Wednesday afternoon. Um, I'd like you to focus not so much on particular numbers because this is draft. Um, it has changed. It will continue to change. Um, in particular, we got some late breaking news today um, that our electric vehicle rates that are in this analysis that were provided to us um, may not be, uh, they may be changing. Um, and we're working with CDOT and the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment to sort of confirm that and understand that. So that may change this analysis. Um, as we continue to do our model runs and our technical analysis, these numbers continue to change a little bit. So it's not so much about specific numbers here, but we did want to show you, at least of as the time we did this set of model runs, whoops, excuse me, we wanted to show you um, kind of where we're at in the big picture in terms of um, uh, in terms of our progress towards meeting the emission reduction targets. So without getting too much into specific numbers, the thought here is, um, again, I talked about the baseline defined in the rule, the plan is adopted. That's the leftmost column on these three sets of, of uh, tables, the GHG base on the left. And then the work we've been doing, what we call the GHG compliance model runs is on the right of each of these twin sets of columns. So we're really comparing where we started as the baseline um, and then where we're at based on the analysis that has been conducted to date. The real key takeaway from this table, regardless of specific numbers, is that everything that I just mentioned in the previous slide, um, the telework, the programmatic investments, the land use uh, adjustments, uh, the project specific adjustments, all of that has been already been incorporated in this table. And so when you see the reduction in uh, greenhouse gases, these are in million metric tons, so for example, 2030, 9.22, reduced down to 8.55, a 7% reduction. That includes all of those strategies. And so at the bottom, when we're showing this gap that we still have, and again, not so much the specific number, but just the idea, we've still got um, a sizable gap to fill. That's on top of everything that we've done up to this date before we talk about mitigation measures. So the point is that everything that we've talked about so far is important and it's meaningful and it's helping us get there. And yet we still have a gap uh, to meet the emission reduction targets by analysis here in the rule. So um, one of the one of the strategies that's incorporated in that table and that I've mentioned is um, sort of the strategic, what I'd call surgical strike uh, changes to some of the projects in the 2050 RTP. One of the things that we've done with project sponsors and with stakeholders individually and now regionally is having a conversation around looking at our major project investment mix in the plan from the lens of the GHG rule and thinking about are there some things we can do, the overall strategy, strategic modifications for GHG benefits, and can we invest in additional uh, programmatic investments within the plan. So we're looking at a few things here. One is, can we um, you know, work with CDOT, work with project partners to potentially make a few strategic modifications to some freeway projects to still include them in the plan and do meaningful things with them and have them focus on safety, operations, transit, um, other aspects of those projects, um, but from a GHG sort of benefit-friendly lens. 
Um, I should mention as well that these project specific changes also include the project based amendments that were requested of us when we opened up the plan uh, for project amendment requests at the beginning of this year, um, as we do in between major updates when we ask for cycle amendments. Um, so these are included as well. Um, we also looked at uh, sort of Dr. Cog directed funded projects in the plan. And again, thinking about on some of the arterial roadway projects, are there things we could do with a few of those projects, again, to solve the problem that those projects are trying to address, but do it in a more GHG friendly way. Big part of the strategy here is our bus rapid transit network that's defined in the plan. We defined a robust series of a, series, a robust network of corridors. 10 to 12 corridors across the region to implement by 2050. Um, we've had some uh, important conversations around, can we advance some of those corridors uh, so that we can get them done sooner and capture the greenhouse gas benefits sooner? And then finally, based on these changes and other changes in the plan, can we, in our financial plan, in our cost feasible, fiscally constrained financial plan, can we, um, can we free up and reallocate some dollars, finance some dollars so that we can invest even more so we can ban some of these BRT corridors for one, but can we free up some dollars um, to invest even more in programmatic investments and non-project investments because they really are important. They really do help get us there. Can we do more of them and can we do them sooner? So that's part of the strategy as well. So that's the strategy and concept. Here's the list. This, these are all, um, these screenshots are attachments in your memo um, in the packet. This is the list of projects that we've been talking with project sponsors about. Um, I'm not gonna go through this list individually. Uh, we can come back to it if there are questions, but again, big you know, overall strategy here is again, can we advance some things that would help us? Can we slightly change the focus of some projects that would help us? Can we do some things at a major project level that still you know, keep these projects in the plan, solve the issues that they're trying to solve, but do it in a way that provides um, incrementally more GHG benefits. It's part of our overall strategy to meet the emission reduction targets in the rule. Um, and then let's talk about mitigation measures. As I said, we talked about this at the June board meeting. Um, as we've said, we do believe that we will need mitigation measures to achieve the emission reduction targets. Uh, we, still, we still do have a sizable gap to close, even when we do everything else that we've talked about so far. We have been analyzing the feasibility and applicability of mitigation measures and concepts from CDOT's policy directive 1610, which was the implemented policy from the GHG rule that spells out the mitigation measures and the specific mitigation measures and the scoring and the GHG benefits associated with uh, specific mitigation measures. Um, as a reminder, you've heard me say that for the Dr. Cog region, because we can directly model or technically analyze certain mitigation measures that are in PD 1610, we've already included those either directly in our modeling or as part of our overall technical analysis. And so we're focusing on things that are outside our modeling environment, outside of our plan environment, things that are more policy oriented, um, things that um, haven't otherwise already been captured in terms of potential mitigation measures. So we're looking at several things. I'm not going to read this list to you, um, but these are consistent with the concepts that we talked about at the regular June board meeting. Um, again, from a more policy perspective, we're looking at several of these concepts as potential mitigation measures. Um, as we started talking about in June, and I want to emphasize again, a couple things. First of all, these are all voluntary. Um, any of these measures that we end up including in a mitigation action plan that the board would adopt does not commit a local government to doing these things. Uh, they are voluntary. Um, they're, the mitigation strategy and the mitigation action plan is not specific to a particular jurisdiction or a particular um, county. This is still a regional analysis. We'll talk about geography in a moment, but we still deal with this at the regional level. I would draw a parallel to our Metro Vision plan. Uh, Metro Vision plan is for the entire region, um, but it also allows for that flexibility based on the unique circumstances of each community. Each community does different things. Um, the local and regional initiatives that are in Metro Vision are voluntary. All of those concepts apply to this as well um, in terms of mitigation measures and a potential mitigation action plan. And then attachment three that's in your packet shows the estimated GHG emission reductions um, associated with the potential implementation of each measure. What I'll say about that is that we've done a lot of sort of back end technical com uh, calculations, complicated technical calculations to understand on a particular measure, you know, what conceptual area could it apply to and then what actual, you know, sort of fraction of that area could it apply to based on the particular parameters of a particular measure. So for example, something like redevelopment, you know, we're looking at particular areas, but even within those areas, how much land might really be redevelopable, for example. So we're trying to be realistic, but, you know, but conservative, 
unfair about you know how these measures would actually apply even within uh, specific geographies. Um, and then the web map, um, you all asked for a web map, others have asked for a web map to illustrate the locations of the geographies, the potential geographies that would be associated um, with most of these proposed mitigation measures. So let me show you that. This is a static um, sort of screenshot of that interactive map. The link is included here at the bottom. Um, when we get to questions, if we want to come back to it, I can actually click on the link and bring up the map and we can look at it. But the point here is that we're looking at four kind of defined geographies throughout the region. Not every mitigation measure would even apply potentially in every geography. Um, they are tailored to specific geographies. And again, even with those geographies, they might only apply to a, a fraction of a particular geography. But the idea is that we wanted to show you um, conceptually and visually where um, the geographies are that are associated with these potential mitigation measures. Um, and then finally, um, you know, the other aspect of the rule that we have been talking about, um, and I want to reemphasize again, is, you know, the ultimate sort of implication or consequence of the rule is that if the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan is not able to demonstrate compliance with the emission reduction targets by analysis here that are specified in the rule. Um, there are restrictions on funds and project eligibility. So this language that you see on the slide and that's in the memo actually comes from the rule that Dr. Cog is the MPO for this region would award surface transportation block grant and CMAC funds and CDOT shall award 10 year plan funds on projects or approved mitigation measures that reduce GHG emissions as necessary to achieve the reduction levels for each compliance here, each analysis here, as specified in the rule. That language comes from the rule, and that would mean that project eligibility for Dr. Cog's uh, TIP calls three and four for the 23-27 TIP would be impacted. Um, and the memo also cites the GHD rule specific language on uh, fund restrictions and a waiver process for individual projects, because that's part of the rule as well. So that's a lot of a lot of work, a lot of concepts, but wanted to keep the presentation short. I'm going to stop there, but happy to circle back on any questions or concepts that folks want to discuss. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, I think uh, if I could, uh, let's see, Director Nirmela, did I pronounce that correctly? Thank you. Thank you. Um... That was actually really helpful, even though short. So thank you. Um, so I do have a couple of questions um, that have stemmed from some of my fellow council members in Westminster. Um, I think there's just an overall concern over how, or so Westminster, I'll back up, has done a lot already to plan for TOD, um, to get mixed use into um, transit oriented areas to um, we've we've reduced parking requirements in particular in our TOD areas. We've done a lot of um, we have a mobility plan. And so as we do improvements throughout the city, we have complete streets being implemented. So I guess the question is like we've done a lot. And so with, with these mitigation measures and things like that kind of coming into play, um would we have to go above and beyond or are there certain sort of levels that hey if you meet this then you know the, the project that you might be applying for is um you know would be um would be allowed or i'm just like i'm trying to well i, yep. I think there's just like back in, you know like going forward then there's just this concern of um how is this going to impact us do we have to do more um, as a community? Yeah, no, those are very good questions. Again, let me start with the initial concept that again, this is all voluntary. So it doesn't require if, if we select some of these mitigation measures, they would be included in a mitigation action plan that the board would adopt. Um, but even taking that action would not require um, anyone or a particular community to do certain things in certain locations at certain times. This is all voluntary. That said, you raise a very good point, And that's something that we tried to account for in our analysis, given the time constraints that we had, is to understand when it comes to transitory development or comes to redevelopment or comes to parking policy or whatever it is, we recognize that as a region, you all have already been doing really great work. Um, and so we're looking for that additional increment of potential, not requirement, but of potential to say, if we know um, that in, you know, in areas around transit stations that, you know, XYZ has already been done, you know, does that allow for, you know, ABC to be further done or, you know, or is that already accounted for? So I guess what I'm saying is that 
we try to include that in our calculations to understand that even in, to pick an example, rail stations for transit-oriented development, a lot of the rezoning has already occurred. A lot of the mm -hmm. um, ordinances and policies have already been set, as you've said. So is there potential across the region to do that little bit more? And that's what we're trying to focus on, not to sort of you know undo or redo uh, what you and Westminster or any other particular jurisdiction have already done, but to say, you know, knowing that these things have already happened, is there a little bit more that can be done? And sort of on that same line, so if we're not meeting regionally the, you know, the emissions um, or the reduction in emissions, then when you're talking about the, the these um, uh, restrictions kind of go into place for the call for the, you know, in 2023 to 2027, um, how does that play? Does that become a requirement for a community then? If they're asking for a certain, you know, for funds for a project, do those mitigation measures then become a requirement? Um, yeah, no, really good voluntary? question. Sorry, yeah, really good question. The short answer is no, they do not. Um, but you, um, let, me, let me kind of clarify the two concepts. Transportation planning is always a snapshot in time. So here's the current snapshot in time. But knowing that, you know, we're going to come back and reassess this, we update our plan every four years, we do amendments in between. And if we do adopt a mitigation action plan in particular, that does trigger a requirement that we need to report on progress each year. So the way this would work is that we're trying to come up with mitigation measures and mitigation action plan that would allow us to meet the reduction requirements or to close the gap. Um, that we find ourselves, at least here, again, draft table numbers will change, but you know the gap that we still have to close for now. Um, so we would adopt a mitigation action plan with specific mitigation measures to close this gap and then go forward from there. And so if we're able to do that, there'd be no fund restrictions at this time at all. We just go forward. But if we, if we adopt a mitigation action plan, as I said, if the board adopts a mitigation action plan, we do need to report on it annually. We need to report on progress. And so if we find after two or three or four years that a particular mitigation measure, you know, the region just hasn't much, done much with, or you know, not getting us as far as we thought it would. You know, then we course correct and we readjust at that time. Um, so the restriction on funds is really about whether or not the plan, the 2050 regional transportation plan, can meet the state greenhouse gas rule by October 1st of this year. The mitigation action plan reporting is just an annual requirement to report on how we're doing as we go forward. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Executive Director Rex, I'm going to let you jump ahead in line because I think you may have something that that related there. Is that correct? It, yes, sir. Thank you very much. It, and um, listen, Jacob answered a lot better than I could, but I do want to just re-emphasize again with regards to what this mitigation strategy is. Right, it, we're looking for opportunities across the region. It is truly a regional strategy, and we're looking for opportunities across the region. This is not a requirement for any one community. To implement, and quite frankly, there are some communities where um, so these mitigation strategies are, for the most part, are not even really relevant, right? Um, so I, I think that's the thing, right? We're 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 willing to, from Dr. Cox's perspective, to provide the resources and support to help you all make determinations or decisions locally um, on whether you know you all are a good fit for for one of these these. Uh, these uh, mitigation strategies. It is, it is, I, again, I can't emphasize enough, it's not a requirement in, over any one community. Great, thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, Director Levy, thank you for your patience. I know you had a question early on, so you're up. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I did have uh, two questions about, if, if you go back to the, um, the chart, um, the table, uh, no, of the, yeah, right there. Uh, I, and the reason I raised my hand early is because it seemed like, well, I had two questions about two assumptions that are built in here that was going to be the foundation for the rest of the conversation. But, um, but you know, just an, an observation about the, this mitigation thing, and I know I raise this every single time because um, that. He, and, and Jacob, you really brought it into focus here. We're going to make some assumptions about a, a mitigation uh, action plan, and then we'll see if it plays out, and we won't know until three or four years down the road. Meanwhile, we're going to have um, several more calls on our tip that are going to make funding decisions based on some greenhouse gas reduction assumptions that assume 
successful implementation of mitigation measures, which may or may not bear out. But that, that's just, a, I'm just editorializing there. The two questions I had about assumptions here have to do with your updated analysis of land use and that the um, it's good news that um, that density um, actually has been greater than what was originally assumed. Um, but there are um, some assumptions that flow about VMT reductions based on, um, on looking at land use on the ground versus what was expected. And I'm, I'm wondering whether that, um, whether those VMT reductions uh, have been validated. Um, so does does the the greater density in housing has it actually translated into VMT reductions? So that's one question. The other is, I guess, sort of a similar question about um, about the telework, the remote work. Um, I don't know whether twenty five percent is the right number or not. That's actually happening. Anecdotally, people say it's bigger than that. But again. Um, that may reduce commuting travel, but are we seeing that? Um, a, a, um, you know, is that the, does that tell the whole story? I guess is there other kinds of travel, midday errand running, and things like that that are counterbalancing that? So I'm just wondering about you know just the the assumptions that go into um, the 20, 30, 40, and 50. Uh, greenhouse gas compliance that are based on the reductions in in, uh, in telework or the increase in telework and the increase in density. Yeah, those are really good questions. So let me try and give concise answers because um, it, it really does get in the technical weeds. No, I guess sorry, first is the question wasn't very concise. So. No, not not at all. Um, so first, you know, let's acknowledge the, the very complicated conceptual relationship between land use, transportation, vehicle miles traveled, electric vehicles, greenhouse gas emission reductions. You know, these are not one for one things, right? It's not like you increase or decrease one and, and the others sort of fall in the line, you know, proportionally. They're very complicated relationships. And thinking back to our scenario planning work for our 2050 plan, um, when, we, when we developed the plan, you know, really shows the complexity of all these different factors on our transportation system and, our, and human behavior ultimately. So to try and directly answer your question, uh, Commissioner Levy, about VMT, um, first, what you're seeing on this chart, first of all, is, is the reduction in VMT. VMT is an output from our model um, and it's based on all the inputs that go into our model, including the land use changes in the roadway network and, and everything else that goes into our model. We have done some, we've done multiple model runs. And so we have looked at, um, you know, sort of the effects of um, changes what we call the near-term land use forecast adjustments um, to try and isolate a little bit what, what kind of happens there. Um, it does help. I want to be clear once again, it's not a strategy to meet the target. The near-term land use forecast adjustments are more about recognizing that the world is developing differently than we originally forecast um, and the forecast that were originally in the 2050 RTP. So it's not, it's not a reduction strategy per se, but yes, it does act um, to at least incrementally help us to meet um, the reduction target. So we are able to a certain extent to look at that relationship between VMT and, and land use, but ultimately uh, the VMT is a model-wide sort of region-wide statistic and, and it's most accurate kind of at that level of analysis. Um, on the telework rate, um, so again, as a reminder here, the 12% that was in our baseline, and baseline is, is defined by the rule, um, that's the amount that was, in, that was assumed in the plan as adopted. Um, that amount is kind of fixed for us. In terms of our GHG runs, um, as you see, 25% telework rate. We have, we have had some... We've had some conversations as staff, you know, sort of challenging each other and being thoughtful with each other around whether it's telework or some of the other factors or to use cliches, levers or dials in the model, what's appropriate, what's realistic, what's defensible, what's feasible, what can we stand behind as transportation planners as professionals um, that is something that we can change in the model to a certain degree, uh, but not, you know, to be assertive, but not be overly aggressive. And so telework is one of those things. Uh, we think 25% is reasonable, particularly given COVID itself, but particularly post-COVID, because this analysis is really looking for these analysis years up to 30 years in the future. So 
you know, we're comfortable with 25% in our sort of cloudy crystal ball, knowing that again, we'll come back and reassess when we update the plan, um, but we didn't feel comfortable doing more than that. Uh, so 25% is the rate that we're using for a GHD analysis. So Director Lee, we did that answer your two questions? Um, I think so. <laughs> um, I, and, and again, I wasn't questioning necessarily the 25% um, telework rate. It was really whether, um, you know, and you said it's not a one for one reduction. You know, there's it's a complex relationship for yes. both the land use and and the remote work. But whether whether you're factoring in, uh, you know, other things there that. Um, oh yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, and um, on the and on the you know the land use. Yeah. Um, the updated uh, land use projections. Um, you know, sometimes dense density increased density only reduces VMT if there um, if there's transit to, to serve that or or if it's a mixed use development so that that density reduces vehicle use because you can walk to things. So again, it's like density in and of itself doesn't reduce VMT. It's density coupled with mis mixed use, coupled with multimodal opportunities. And that's what I'm, I'm wondering is whether all of that is really captured in that projected Reduction. Yeah, I appreciate that. I see my colleague Robert Spots, who's actually a lot smarter than me, and I'm going to give him that hard question. De definitely not smarter. Um, no, I mean, so we are not being prescriptive about this, right? We're not saying 25% of people telework now and they just stay at home all day. Our model um, reacts to the way people telework. So we capture people in our surveys that work from home and we still see them make many trips, right? They still could take kids to school, go to the coffee shop, go to the hardware store. So we are that still happens in our model. More of them are working from home, so they're not going to their regular place of work, but they are still taking trips, many trips. And as for land use, same thing. You know, we're, we're basically, as, as observed, we're seeing more people in relatively more dense areas so that we're putting those in there in the model and they are just exposed to those new conditions, as it were. They are exposed to not necessarily transit, but they may be in a transit rich area or an area that has better pedestrian infrastructure, but it's all about where we observe that growth happening, putting the people there, and then the model is the one that's running the model like it always has been run. People reacting to their built environment, to their household situation, to observe behavior, all those things. Well, and I have other questions, but I'll save them for later. Thanks a lot. Director Coombs. Thank you. Um, so I'm thinking about mitigations and kind of the layering of mitigations. So if a city or a group of cities wanted to take on something really ambitious and wanted to really pilot like a 15 minute city concept in a particular neighborhood and then do a combination of like road diet and land use changes and multimodal improvements and maybe some BRT as part of that road diet. Um, like to what extent are we going to be able as an entity to support really kind of creative and big changes versus just smaller kind of, we're gonna add some bike lanes here or this is a predefined BRT corridor or things along those lines. Yeah, thank you for your question. I think the short answer is yes. Um, yes to all of the above. So the mitigation measures are really structured to be somewhat of a mix and match. Um, again, they're region-wide in, in scope, and we know that um, you know, if, if we go forward with some of these mitigation measures, they land differently on individual communities because you're all unique, right? And so in a particular jurisdiction, you know, you may be able to do one or two or three or five things. And so whatever it is that you can do, that you want to do, that you go forward with, you know, we're here to help you do that. Again, it's all voluntary, but if you can do several of those things, as you mentioned, then yes, absolutely. Um, you know, you can do those things, you'd be encouraged to do those things and that all, that all helps. And we would then capture all of that in, in the annual reporting that would be required. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I'm just wondering again, you know, we, as far as like funding support, um, if we're able to really provide the kind of funding that would be needed to make a major change or how we might advise cities to 
look to other partners in addition to Dr. Cog and being able to make that happen? Yeah, it's a good question. The rule itself and the requirement with the rule doesn't unfortunately come with its own set of funding to implement some of these things. Um, but again, presuming if we did go forward with the mitigation action plan, you know, Dr. Cog and Dr. Cog staff stands ready and willing to work with communities and to, you know, help with resources that we can provide or help you connect to resources that are out there um, to be able to implement some of these things. So no, there isn't a dedicated funding pot, um, but there are other resources that we can make those linkages to that would help um, to be able to implement some of these things for sure. Thank you. I'm going to jump ahead real quick to uh, Mr. Papsdorf, uh, if you've got something specific on, on that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, Director Coombs, I think part of your question around the transportation improvements, like let's not forget the regional transportation plan is not just a greenhouse gas rule plan. It is our region's plan for an investment strategy on important transportation improvements throughout the region. And so if there are, if there are big new investments that you are anticipating that are not already in our regional transportation plan, we need to have a conversation about those, right? Because a new BRT corridor that's not already identified in the regional transportation plan or being amended as part of this update, you know, can't really move forward until it's amended into the regional transportation plan. We think we've 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 done enough work with all of our member jurisdictions through our through our planning process that we think we've identified those high priority BRT corridors already in the plan. Um, but if there, are, if there are other things that you're anticipating, uh, we should have a conversation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Director Spear. Thank you. Um, and I just want to say thanks to staff as well. Uh, just what what an absolutely incredible amount of work to collect all this information and keep updating um, these predictions as we go along. So thank you for that. Um, you know, as I'm kind of sitting in this, I think I've raised similar concerns uh, in, pa in past discussions. We're largely setting goals um, based on things that we don't seem to have a whole lot of control over as an organization, right? Um, land use, transit service, those are not things that we control. Um, so as I'm kind of thinking about these questions, I just wanted to say out loud that what's front and center in my mind is how can we get some control over whether or not we reach our goals? How can we kind of get just a little more um, accountability on our end, things that we we can make decisions about. Um, and you know, one of the things that I'm thinking about is about a lot of the mitigation measures um, being dependent on bus rapid transit service that um, RTD hasn't committed to providing. So um, how is this accounted for in the mitigation action plan? I mean, what happens if that bus rapid transit service doesn't pan out? Yeah, thank you for your question. So um, let me start with your first question and use that as a segue to answer your second question. Um, you're right that we don't directly control a lot of the things that we're talking about um, in this analysis for sure. But I will say in our regional planning role and our metropolitan planning organization role um, of regional transportation planning in this region, you know, we do set priorities. We do set a framework for investment. Uh, we do make funding decisions through the transportation improvement program. We do have ways that we can influence collaboration, policy, funding, priorities, investments, et cetera. Now we do that in partnership with all of you and we do it in partnership with RTD and CDOT and it's gonna take those partnerships and it's gonna take all of those agencies I just named, all the local governments, all the regional agencies and others to be able to do this and to achieve what we're talking about here for sure. Um, but I wanna recognize the role of those partnerships and, and our sort of lead role as the regional transportation planning agency in this region. For the first part of your question, for the second part of your question, as a specific example, the bus rapid transit network that's defined in the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan was actually defined as that multi-agency partnership. We recognize that RTD wouldn't have the funding to construct, um, you know, fully construct and operate all of those BRT corridors. So if you actually look in Table 3.1 of the plan, you know, it recognizes that it's going to take multiple agencies, it's going to take multiple funding sources, might even take multiple operators, but it's going to take you know, it's going to take that concept of partnership and it's going to take that, it's going to need that to be able to implement the bus rapid transit network across the region. So you're absolutely right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Director, Director Spear, did that address your questions? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think it did, right? And I mean, these, you know, these are things that, that we know, right, that it really depends on um, partnerships and our ability to work within our communities to drive some of these changes. And 
um, being somebody who works within my community to try to drive changes, that's hard, right? It's, it's hard it and it's not, um, it's not fast and it's not always successful, especially when you're talking at least here in our community about um, density, things like that, right? Um, and so I just, I just worry that, you know, we're kind of setting ourselves up to um, fail in, in four years, right? And, and failure isn't a bad thing. I was just talking to my daughter about this last night when she got her AP scores back. Um, it, it can really help us grow and, you know, find those opportunities for innovation and change and how we can set ourselves up for success more. And I guess, you know, the question I'm sort of pondering is, um, is it better to sort of admit that we're, we're not likely to kind of meet where we need to be as it is now so that we can think about um, what it is that we could change now to, to move things forward. And sorry, I'm uh, to use um, Commissioner Levy's <laughs> words, I'm editorializing now, but let me, let me get to my, to my next question. Um, I, my next question is really just, you know, thinking about this, about how we, we do seem to be a little bit um, off uh, from, from where, where we need to be and we don't have a lot of control um, over the things we'd like to have control over to make this happen. So, you know, I'm wondering if um, we could get back to thinking about incentivizing, um, incentivizing people to not submit as many car capacity projects uh, moving forward in these next couple of tip calls, which I know are coming up so soon and everybody's already been doing a lot of work for it. Um, but the, the analogy that came to mind as I was reading through this, some, you know, if you're, um, an airplane is full, right? And it's sort of, they're looking for people to <laughs> take the next plane. Um, they'll often offer some incentive, right? So for, for us in Boulder County, um, you know, it's a little easier to not think about doing car capacity projects than it is for um, another group. And, you know, what, what would it look like if, um, you know, we were to uh, forego a little bit of our funding or something like that to incentivize another area to be able to, um, to move forward. So I guess it's just, I guess my, my question, sorry, is really around um, whether we can think about kind of passing the hat again, requesting additional um, cuts being made throughout the region, if there are any people who would, or any groups that would be willing to um, back off of some projects that we know are going to move us in the wrong direction with regard to these targets, and incentivize that, right, by taking from a, a little bit from the, the different groups that are um, already moving in, in those directions. If that makes sense. And I'm going to apologize in advance. I had surgery a few days ago. My brain's still coming out of it. <laughs> so mm. sorry for being rambling and a little confusing. Well, first, best wishes on a speedy recovery. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Best wishes on a speedy recovery, first thank of you. all, Director Spear. Um, but in terms of the relationship with the TIP and project funding, let me ask Ron to weigh in on that. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, Director Spear, I, I, look, I, th I think at this point, keep in mind, it's really important to remember that the vast majority of the funds that are allocated through Dr. Cog's tip process are already restricted to sort of non-roadway capacity projects. Um, and, um, you know, so if, for instance, this tip cycle, the entirety of the, of the four calls, well over two thirds of the funds are restricted to multimodal projects, projects that specifically improve air quality, provide bike pad or transit facilities or services. Um, and, and, you know, history, our history is that even those flexible funds, a significant amount of those end up being allocated to multimodal projects too. Um, we have not, and staff is not proposing any changes to our TIP policy for this TIP call. Uh, we think it provides a good amount of flexibility and the appropriate amount uh, and the appropriate mix of funding to specific projects to meet a variety of needs across the region. Um, and there are, there are bottleneck locations. There are safety problems where, you know, there, there can be a, a, an appropriate approach um, to, to improve those. And we think it's important to maintain that flexibility uh, in, this, in the TIP process and stay consistent with the board's adopted TIP policy at this point. And I think what, what Jacob's talking about is we will continue to monitor progress uh, towards achieving these goals and implementing these mitigation measures. We'll have an annual opportunity to sort of check in and see where we are. And prior to the next TIP, pro tip call, the next four-year TIP process, We'll, we'll know what kind of progress we're making and see if we have to adapt and, and adjust and, and, and make, any, make any changes. 
Yeah, thank you for that. And I, you know, again, I, I don't mean to kind of dismiss the, the work or, you know, opinions or anything like that. I think where I'm coming from is just from this place of, you know, we're, we're truly in an emergency with regard to our climate, right? And, you know, how, how are we preparing our community for what's coming? And, you know, is is four years a little long in, in a time of a climate emergency. So that's that that's just that's where I'm coming from. But I, I fully appreciate it. And thank you again for everything that you all are doing. Great, thank you very much. Director Maurer. Thank you. Um, yeah, and um, Jacob, thanks a lot for going through that table. That, that helped me a lot. Um, you mentioned a couple things. So I'm just wondering if maybe you can um, shed a little more light. You were talking on the EV rates maybe changing. Can you just tell me what that means? You know, what, what, what you're looking at? And then also, you know that interactive um, web map, will we have access to that? Um, let me answer your second question first, because it's easier. Um, you should already have access to it. There should be a link in the packet. Um, oh, and it gotcha. should be publicly okay. accessible, no password or anything. So, um, Director Maurer, anyone, if you click on that and for some reason you're not able to access it, just let me know. Um, but yeah, that's out there in the public realm for you. Um, regarding your first question, I don't have a lot to say yet. Just the, the point I wanted to make for transparency is that we did find out sort of late breaking news today that um, emission, or sorry, emission, electric vehicle rates um, are part of the calculus that, that um, is part of the entire um, sort of rulemaking in the state's greenhouse gas um, analysis. And so um, electric vehicle rates were used um, in building the rule um, and as part of, um, you know, part of the baseline that was set for us and, and part of the reduction targets that were set for us. And we've learned today that the rates may be changing. Um, so we're not sure about that. I just don't have a lot to say about it, but we're investigating that with CDOT and the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Um, but if those rates change, it could change our baseline and it could change the parameters of our analysis. And that's why in that first table that I showed, I just wanted to caution you that those numbers are draft and subject to change. That's all. And you're thinking it's positive, right, Jacob? No. Oh. I, I don't want to okay. opine yet, but um, <laughs> um, we're not sure yet. All right. Thank you. Definite moving targets, right? Uh, Director Harrison. Thank you very much. Um, so quickly, just uh, the local question that I have, I just want a confirmation of obviously being from Erie is, and I'm trying to remember because I think we was talked about previous meeting, is Erie included in this whole process in terms of the gas analysis, what I see on the interactive map? I just wanted yeah. To and actually, let me, uh, let me bring that back up. Actually, why don't I bring up the interactive map because I've got it available. Yeah, I have that interactive map up and it's, I see a broad, dark outline. I just wanted to make sure that was indeed. Yeah. So hopefully you all can see this. Let me zoom out a little bit. This dark outline that the director is referring to is our MPO, our Metropolitan Planning Organization boundary. Um, and it is the boundary that is subject to the rules. So in other words, Dr. Cog is responsible for demonstrating rule compliance for everything within our MPO boundary, which is our urban areas, uh, which does include Erie. Uh, this portion of Southwest Weld County. Areas outside of this dark line, particularly Clear Creek and Gilpin County, and then Eastern Adams and Arapaho, east of Kiowa Creek right here. Um, those are outside our MPO boundary. Those fall under CDOT's jurisdiction for the purposes of demonstrating compliance with the rule. So let me say that a, another way in plain English. CDOT and the other MPOs in the state are also um, subject to this rule, and they're also undergoing the same analysis that that we've been talking about with you. So CDOT, for example, also has to demonstrate compliance with the rule for the non-MPO areas of the state. Okay, that clarifies for me. I appreciate that. On the second question, in regard to earlier, as mentioned about the BRT being the main, one of the strategic tenants of trying to achieve what we're gonna do. With BRT that we have from Boulder to Denver, what has been, uh, what is the data on that in terms of what improvement it has done in this area for the time that it's been out there and in, in, in operation. Do we have that data at, at hand? Yeah, improvement director in terms of like ridership or? Uh, in, in, if there is a way from a GHC perspective, what, what has it been helpful in terms of climate or in terms of um, reducing gas emissions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess what I'd say, and I'd, I'd invite Robert to help me with this, but um, pre-pandemic, you know, certainly the project was very successful um, in terms of ridership and, and some of the traditional metrics that are used to 
uh, to evaluate um, projects like that. I mean, very, very successful um, investment in that corridor. In terms of our GHG analysis and in terms of the rule requirements, we're not looking at a project by project analysis. It's not a project based rule. It really mm -hmm. is a regional based rule, everything within this black boundary. Um, so we're not looking at individual projects, but we know from our modeling that you know, the project changes, the programmatic changes, the land use changes, it takes every little bit sort of building that layer cake framework to help us reach the emission reduction target. So probably a little bit unfair to say that a particular project is really good or really bad, but it is more fair to say that these types of projects together, coupled with these other strategies, help get us there. And that's the approach that we've been taking in this analysis. Does that answer your question, sir? Yes, it does. And then uh, the third I did have here is actually one that uh, uh, Rich Kondo brought up in the chat and I wanted to highlight for him. Um, are we surveying large employers and what their future intentions are for in-person and work from home plans? Because obviously I've thought about this having lived on, in Denver on the south side of Denver for 25 years or so and you know, moving up to where I am now is just that amount how, where people live in relation to where they work and what and what incentives has there always been uh even back in 96 97 i was thinking in my head was well if they're living because they can afford to live on the north side of denver but they're commuting all the way to 25 to the south side yeah i mean that's a major computer contributor to obviously traffic so has there been any strategy about working with the with companies in terms of where they put their businesses in relation to where their intellectual capital is so that we can kind of reduce that effort, uh, that impact on our roadways, number one. I think that's the big thing. And to that survey piece, has there been anything done? Yeah, I appreciate that. So I'll mention two quick things. One is that Dr. Cobb's Way to Go program, our transportation demand management program, continuously works with employees and employers to kind of understand, um, you know, options available, provide, you know, commuting options, um, you know, what are employees doing? What are employers doing? So we kind of have that continuous outreach with our network of transportation management agencies and organizations across um, the region. There are seven of those um, currently, and then Dr. Cog functions as one for the entire region. Um, so I think that kind of dialogue that you're suggesting is, has been happening quite a bit. Um, and that's part of part and parcel of what the TDM program does your way to go um, every day. So those, those conversations are definitely happening and you're right to highlight their importance. The other thing that we'll be doing is within the next year or so, Robert or Steve, correct me if I'm wrong in the timing, we will be undertaking in conjunction with CDOT um, what at least was called last time front range travel counts, but it's basically a uh, kind of household diary survey to understand um, people's actual commuting patterns, our mobility patterns, to really get sort of a representative sample that we can then use uh, to calibrate our regional travel model. That answered my question. Thank you very much. No further questions. Okay, thank you. Director Teal. Thanks, Steve. Uh, hey, Jacob, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask a second question for the second time in a day, but I promise to be far more efficient on this one. I'm glad that you have the map up. If you could just zero in for us um, on, on just an area, pick an area. Uh, actually, Douglas Cup County is probably a really bad example, but actually right there, that's pretty good. I, I mean, I noticed um, when we talked about um, these developable plots of land and how that was a part of the um, modeling on how land use improvements could be um, a big part of the solution. I notice here, um, you know, we're not seeing individual pieces of land. We're kind of seeing big swaths. We're seeing the big blue circles. Um, can you tell us how we got from those individual plots of land that we did the analysis on, what could be improved in order to assist in the greenhouse gas emissions reduction to where we got with this map? I wonder if you could kind of fill us in on that. And then I've got a follow-up question that you know is coming. Okay. Well, if you've asked the question a second time, let me try and answer it better the second time. Um, so big picture here, I mean, the, the, the punchline answer is just a lot, of, a lot of math and a lot of technical analysis, but just to be clear and transparent, first we define the geographies and that's what you're seeing on this map. So for example, when we're looking at um, geography around rail stations, uh, we decided a half mile kind of buffer around rail stations was appropriate um, because there's plenty of research that documents the fact that 
transit-oriented development can have an influence within about a half mile of rail station. So first we define those overall geographies. Then with the time constraints that we had and the data that we had available, then we looked at for the entire region, we tried to understand, okay, you know, we know that a lot of it's already developed. We know that some of it's already been zoned for development or redevelopment. We know that there's active construction occurring. We know that there's entitlements. We know there's open space in schools and cemeteries and X, Y, Z. So we tried to sort of factor in all that. We tried to net all of that out. It's sort of, sort of this sifting. And we're sifting and sifting and sifting to get to the point where we can understand at regional level what's reasonable to assume in terms of how much land might actually be available within these defined geographies for the thing that we're looking at. So the example I've given is development around rail stations, but whether it's parking policy, whether it's redevelopment, whether it's you know, rezoning or whatever it is, we try to do that sort of sifting layered technical analysis to understand. Um, and it's really sort of fractions of fractions because the geography as defined here for the entire region is really a fraction of the region. And within any of these particular geographies, I'll pick one near me, um, you know, even within these geographies, you know, probably a fraction of them were available for any particular mitigation strategy. So as best we could, we tried to do the math and kind of understand that to be realistic about the effectiveness and the implementability of a particular mitigation measure. Cool. So then follow-up question would be, uh, again, for the second time today, uh, knowing that there's actual individual plots of land that go into this graphic representation. And, you know, as you just said, uh, having wanting this to be at a high level analysis, but knowing, and I think we heard it in a question from Director Namella and Director Spear in a little bit from Director Coombe of, there may be jurisdictions that really wanna target some of these developable areas to provide those incentives locally in order to encourage, uh, is that data gonna be available for individual jurisdictions perhaps air gapped between our strategic analysis, but available for these for our local jurisdictions to make use of, to, to establish those incentive programs uh, at a local level in order to help be a part of the bigger solution? Yeah, so short answer is yes. The slightly longer answer is that um, for now, we're trying to find a regional strategy that seems effective, seems applicable, seems to make sense uh, for this region that we would propose in a mitigation action plan. If we go forward with that and the board adopts a mitigation action plan and we work together as a region to implement it, then absolutely we stand ready to work with any particular jurisdiction to understand, you know, within your jurisdiction, you know, what parcels, what areas, what, what mitigation measures, because again, not every mitigation measure is going to apply to every jurisdiction and certainly not going to apply to every geography, uh, right, or even every identified geography. So absolutely willing to work with individual jurisdictions as we go forward to say, how can we help you um, and how can we work with you to sort of figure out the implementation of a particular of a particular mitigation measure within a particular area. Cool. Thank you, Jacob. Thanks, Steve. Right, thank you very much. Uh, we've got a couple of folks that have already asked questions. We'll come to you in a moment, but I want to first go to Director Mulvey. Hi, thank you. I hope you can hear me. I lost my voice a little bit. We can hear uh, you. Awesome. So we had the opportunity, and thank you, gentlemen, for sharing some information about this at our sub region all earlier today. It was super helpful. And um, I remain concerned that because of some uniqueness in some of the communities from one another, that different people use things for different reasons, different uh, parking structures, they need to drive their kids to work, which you all hear me talk about all the time, or to school. You know, you've got to get your kids to somewhere good, not let them stay at home and do nefarious things. People need cars for that. And they might not need a car for that in Denver. They certainly need a car for that in uh, perhaps Arvada or Jeffco or some of our other areas, y'all know I'm from Dugco. So I remain concerned about that. I also remain concerned that this gets a little into zoning. And so even though this is an aspirational document, it's not a requirement. It always concerns me that when we head down a road like this, at some point we hit a block and say, oh my God, we have to do this. And are we going to start telling people what to do with their zoning ordinances or restricting people from having the ability to park that second car and get that second kid to basketball practice because it's 20 miles away or five miles away? 
So I want to make sure that we have that in mind when we're looking at these things, not to start thinking about imposing on communities that could use some flexibility something that one community needs and another might not have the same concern. So thank you for listening. Uh, thank, appreciate it. Thank you. Director Mulvey, would you like a response? That's at your option. You did share with the group at the outset here, I think the same response that we discussed earlier, that it's an aspirational document, but thank you. Uh, Jacob, uh, Mayor Peck, uh, in chat said she had some of the same concerns. So why don't you respond briefly, just so, so you know, if, if you've got perspective on that, that could help. Okay, um, appreciate that. I'll start a response and I'll ask Ron to chime in as well. First, again, to emphasize completely voluntary. So none of this is requiring or directing any particular community or jurisdiction to do any particular thing or implement a particular thing at a particular time. This is all voluntary. Um, and again, I draw the parallel with MetroVision, you know, the local and regional initiatives within MetroVision, completely voluntary. Um, so first of all, and that's an important point to, to reemphasize. Secondly, in terms of some specific concerns around, you know, sort of parking and parking policy, first, it's, it's parking policy based, it's not car based. Um, and it's parking policy based around development, new development or redevelopment going forward. It's not about how many cars can I have? And, and you know, you're talking to someone who's got two cars, right? Two, two kids and two cars. So totally get it. You know, this isn't about restricting cars or about car use. Um, but it is about in appropriate locations for specific types of development in particular situations, you know, is there, you know, could there be some flexibility potentially if the jurisdiction wanted it around parking policy for certain types of development or redevelopment um, going forward um, in terms of the, the, the local context of the land use and mobility options available around, um, you know, around a particular sort of development. From there, let me kind of hand it off to Ron. Thank you, Jacob. <laughs> I, uh, look, I, we need to be clear uh, around this table with all of you that in, in the state of Colorado, land use and zoning is a local government issue. Uh, Dr. Cog, as an agency, has no authority to require any of you to do anything in terms of land use and zoning. Um, this exercise does give us an opportunity to have a conversation about are there opportunities around the region to consider some changes like Westminster has done uh, to support the uh, to support and and tie into pretty significant transportation investments that have been made in their community um, and many jurisdictions around the region have done those where it's appropriate where it makes sense from a local government standpoint and a local community standpoint with lots of involvement with your community and, and with a decision made by your governing board, your city council, your county commission. None of this changes that. Um, our, our proposal um, is, is about identifying those opportunity areas where we think some of these things could be feasible, but ultimately it's up to you uh, to consider with us where, if that's true and where it might be true. And you know, our role and our commitment is to support those efforts, to provide you information, to provide you tools, best practices, anything that you need uh, to help consider those opportunities and make those decisions for yourselves. Our role is to think about this as a region as a whole, track those activities as regionally to see if we can make progress. And I, I just wanna remind all of you that you know, this analysis and, and the mitigation measures analysis we've done so far sort of really is focused on fractions of these areas. It's not even, it doesn't even rely on all of this, all of these changes happening in the entirety of these geographies. Uh, we did a parcel based analysis to try to hone in on sort of what opportunities might exist, focused on sort of vacant and redevelopable parcels where there's not as much improvement already in place within these geographies. Um, so um, again, we're, we're, we can't require anything. We can, we can ask, we can support, we can suggest, uh, but we cannot require. And that's, that's, not where we're, that's not where we're heading. Great, thank you. Director Nermella. Thanks, sorry for the extra <laughs> questions. Um, I would just say that um, just piggybacking on everything that's been said regarding 
the, you know, I know a lot of communities have a more suburban feel and Westminster also has a, is a very suburban community. We just happen to have some great transit spots that we have tried to take full advantage of. And they're only, I mean, it's 180 acres cumulatively of where we have, you know, around our two transit stops that are key and um, out of 34 square miles. So, it, in which <laughs> the majority of it is suburban is, you know, lots of cars. And so we're, you know, so it doesn't have to be a full change of your community. But um, that wasn't my question. Um, I, just, I, I did, you know, for, for me as a, as a planner by trade, I'm always trying to look at, right, how are we um, making sure that our assumptions are as accurate as possible. So I, as we go through this, it would be just helpful to know what is our timeline to measure and check our assumptions? And, and then what are we using? Because, you know, for instance, transit, if you go to the coasts, right, you can just assume like, if you've got a transit station, you're 40% you're VMT reduction around that transit station. That's a lot different um, in, in, other, in, area, in, in other areas, right? So our culture in Denver doesn't quite get us to 40% and our transit quality doesn't quite get us to that. So I'm, I, I'm just trying to make sure that our assumptions are relevant to our culture and, our, and what we're actually achieving. Um, and then my second question is, and maybe you, you've answered this in, <laughs> in another presentation at some point, but how are we, actually measuring our, reduct, our, um, our GHG reductions? Is it like actual air quality measurements or, um, or are we just using models to, to give us information? The reason I ask is, you know, I just like quickly looked because I know our built environment and energy production you know, provides a ton of other GHGs that you know, the EPA says on their little pie, Transportation is just 27% of that. So um, in terms of you know, the contribution to our GHGs. So I'm just curious how we're actually measuring and knowing that what we're doing is working. Yeah, um, appreciate your questions. Let me start with the first one and maybe I'll ask Robert to answer your second question. Um, for your first question, and I'm sorry, I just had it. Tell me, tell me again, I'm sorry. I just had it and then it escaped. Is uh, just our assumptions, like how are we making sure that- Oh, being right, yeah. So a couple of things, right? Thank you so much. Um, so first, you know, transportation planning is a snapshot in time. And so this is our current snapshot, but we will have several opportunities to reassess. Uh, we're federally required, we would do so anyway, but we are federally required to update the regional transportation plan every four years. So that's a major checkpoint. Uh, we amend the plan every year. As Ron and I have spoken about, if we adopt a mitigation action plan, we're reporting on that on an annual basis. If we make a, a major change to the plan, um, even between four-year updates, you know that does trigger the greenhouse gas rule, and so we go through some version of this analysis again, et cetera, et cetera. The point is that there are several sort of checkpoints along the way, and there's several opportunities for us to kind of reassess, you know, how are we doing? How are we doing from a mitigation measure perspective? How are we doing in terms of implementing projects and the assumptions around the time frame of implementing projects or you know, the traffic or transit ridership or whatever associated with those projects once implemented. So lots of opportunities for those checkpoints um, because it is a snapshot in time and things do change um, and they do change frequently. And so that is part of this is going back over time and just sort of, you know, reassessing where are we at? Do we need to, do we need to change course? Uh, regarding your second question on the modeling, I think I'll ask Robert to, uh, to help me answer that. Robert? Sure. Maybe, maybe step back for the, the first question a little bit too, is that again, you know, our, our regional travel model is calibrated and validated to observe data in the region. So, you know, we, we observe how many transit boardings and transit trips there were in the region, and that's what we match in our travel model. So, um, you know, when, when you do things like add new service, really good new service, you can increase transit trips, and that's just kind of logical, but that means the little virtual people in our model are reacting to that. Or if you put 10,000 people right smack down on a light rail station, that light rail line in the model would react by having more of those users use the model. But in a very 
Denver centric, completely calibrated to our region and the observed travel behavior and infrastructure in this region. So that's that's how that's represented in the model. As far as greenhouse gas emissions and monitoring those, there is, as far as I know, no way of monitoring those emissions at, at, at the um, like emission monitor sites like there is for ozone, CO, EM10, things like that. There's no way to do that. So we are relying on our travel model, which outputs kind of tr total travel speeds, um, you know, load share, things like that. That feeds into what's called the, the EPA's MOVES model, Motor Vehicle Emission Simulator, and that's what estimates um, what the total emissions of greenhouse gas um, coming from the surface transportation sector. You know, I guess larger scale, there could be discussions about monitoring the total amount of gasoline sold, sold in the state. That would be a way to kind of, because every gall gallon of gasoline when burned, produces the exact same amount of CO2. It's not like ozone, which is a complicated chemical reaction or anything like that. So large scale, that something like that could happen or even regionally, but there's no way to monitor at, at monitors. Great, thank you very much. Director Leedy. Yeah, thanks. Um, my questions, well, I have two and they're interrelated and, um, and, and the first one goes to the mitigation measure action plan that uh, may come to this board at some point. Um, and the question has sort of evolved a little bit as I've been listening to the conversation. Uh, there's, you know, there's a lot of consternation and confusion about exactly what would be proposed in a mitigation uh, action plan um, because of local control of land use, which is completely understandable. We, you know, we really uh, zealously guard that local control here in Boulder County, uh, everybody as much as Arapaho County and Douglas County and, and all of the constituent municipalities do, uh, because we think we <laughs> have very good progressive uh, environmentally responsible land use patterns. They work for our community and other communities um, have different goals in mind. And, and uh, Dr. Cog's staff have emphasized um, at every opportunity um, that these mitigation measures are voluntary. And I have to confess, as many times as I've listened to these presentations, and, um, and I tried to participate very robustly in our, all of our sessions on co commenting on the greenhouse gas reduction rule, I do not understand what a mitigation measure action plan would be comprised of and how we can really reliably um, factor any greenhouse gas reduction um, uh, projections uh, into our, our overall plan based on the entirely voluntary nature of it and then um, the only thing I see in attachment three that, um, you know, that is really predictable is to optimize arterial signals. Uh, but, you know, the real, the real bang for the buck comes from um, TOD density and parking restrictions. So I, I, you know, I do need to understand how is it that we put a, you know, what would that be comprised of? Uh, and when this board is asked is asked to asked to act on that, um, you know what what certainty do we have that it will actually be um, successful? And and this relates to I guess this, so that's my that's that's my question. This is my my main concern with this whole exercise. And I you know there are things we know we can do. Uh, that are within our immediate power to do, which have to do with the transportation improvements that we do fund and the amount of, um, of funds that we direct towards multimodal transportation um, options. And with that, that list of projects um, in the RTP, are there, were there projects that were proposed for modification that were not um agreed to and are not incorporated that we could go back and revisit where we would have much more certain 
um, much more certainty over the greenhouse gas reductions. Oh, thank you, Director Levy. Let me start with the very hey, last thing. Hey, Jacob, let me take this. Okay. Um, Director Levy, thank you so much. It's a really important question. And there are actually a couple of questions in there. So I want to start with the last on the transportation adjustments in the plan, because um, they are significant. And that list that's in the presentation that Jacob went over, those are, those are, fairly, those are pretty significant changes, and they're ambitious. Um, we're talking about trying to complete as a region um, five bus rapid transit corridor projects over the course of the next eight years. Um, that's huge. Um, and that's a significant change. That's, and that's a, that's a pretty significant change even from an already ambitious 2050 RTP that you all adopted just last year. Um, there, there were not changes that we, that we proposed or considered and talked to partners about that um, were, have not been agreed to at this point. And, and we're, we're assuming, so that list of changes, and we think those are reasonable changes. We think those are actually aggressive changes and things that will really make a difference and move the needle. And there's not a whole lot more we can do um, uh, to, to, that we could actually accomplish um, um, or that would, would um, significantly move the needle further than what we're doing. Um, on, the, on the second, on, the fir on your first question related to the mitigation uh, action plan. It's an excellent question. Um, we have we attempted today to summarize a set of very complex analyses that we've been working on to try to show sort of the the order of magnitude of greenhouse gas emission reductions following the policy direct CDOT's policy directive that they adopted uh, their methodology uh, to to demonstrate that we could we could hopefully achieve the reduction levels that are called for in the rule. Uh, through those mitigation measures. So there's a lot of a detailed analysis behind that one table that sort of shows a summary. Um, and we're working on now, because <laughs> all of this is happening very, very fast. Uh, we're working now on trying to put that together, a draft sort of mitigation action plan that would lay out exactly what those are. But uh, for let me give you an example uh, for um, the mixed use transit oriented development, moderate density uh, measure. Um, the, the mitigation action plan might say something like, Rezone areas for mixed use TOD accommodating at least 15 residential units per acre and 100 jobs per acre. That would be a regional objective. Um, that would be over the course of the next 28 years to 2050. And then there would be a certain amount of acres that we would be targeting uh, for each horizon year that we needed the mitigation uh, measure. Uh, so 2030, 2040, and 2050, and a, and a certain amount. And we would track progress on actions that any of you took each year and report that progress uh, to the Transportation Commission. And over time, if we're not making enough progress to hit that horizon year target, then we'll have to reevaluate and rethink and consider other mitigation measures, other actions that we could that we could take. Uh, so that's kind of how that's how we're structuring this and and sort of it, it, it does tie specifically to the way the mitigation measures and the analysis are um, identified in the mitigation measures policy directive that the Transportation Commission adopted and our analysis of those geographic areas where we think they are most appropriate to be considered. And there's real opportunities to actually make, make some progress. All right, thank, thank you. That's, that's a, the clearest explanation I've heard of how this would work. And, but it doesn't alleviate my concerns and I'm sorry. Um, it's because what, what we hear every time in this conversation is some communities um, saying that these these don't work for us. This is not what our community wants to look like, and so we can we can adopt a plan that that says you know we're going to target a, a certain number of acres for you know a certain density of mixed use TOD development, um, but if if we don't um, incorporate um, carrots and sticks. Uh, um, with that, we're not going to get there because the communities that want to grow more densely will continue to do that. The communities that don't will not. Um, and I think we're going to have to really seriously consider uh, tying um, funding to communities that are, are willing to adopt these mitigation measures. And so I, I hope when we when this comes forward, for a vote that what we see is that 
um, is that the, the funds will follow. Uh, and um, because I don't, I don't see any other way for this to be effective. And, and I'll, I'll just reiterate the concern I've, I've expressed many times, which is that we'll put this plan in place. We won't know until a lot of funds have already gone out the, the door, um, whether it's having any effect at all. And so then we'll be down the road with, you know, with higher reduction requirements in place and, and we'll be out of options. And then we'll be looking at having to turn back funds. So that, you won't hear anything more from me tonight. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Chair, if I, if I could, Director Levy, I, I really appreciate that perspective and, 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 I, and I hear you, right? And, um, but, but I also wanna say that, you know, I live down in the South side of the region. Um, and um, I've seen the kinds of changes that the city of Lone Tree has made around light rail stations on, on the South Light Rail Transit ex Expansion Project. Ex extensive. The, just the kind of development density you would want to see around transit stations and light rail stations. Um, so the idea that these things can only happen in downtown Denver or in Boulder, I think is not correct. Um, there, are, there are areas where this makes sense. I, I live outside of downtown Parker and I go to downtown Parker and there's, you know, these levels of densities exist in even a community like downtown Parker. So they, they can work and, and there are opportunities across the region. And again, our commitment to you is that as, as an agency, as your staff, we will provide any support, any information, any resources to help you um, identify those appropriate opportunities for your communities um, and, and assist where, where, there, where there are those opportunities and where you're willing to consider these measures. And thank you, Ron. And I'm sorry, I did not mean to imply that, that there are areas, you know, that aren't appropriate or aren't, you know, it's more, it's more community willingness. And, and I, I, I'm, you know, as I travel around the metro area, um, I'm so impressed with with the, the changing uh, landscape of development, and that yes, it is more dense. Uh, and so I'm, I didn't mean to suggest that that it, it, it's only appropriate in Denver or Boulder, or, you know, really com already compact communities. It's it's more the the very voluntary nature okay. of it, um, and um, you know, and the fact that as Fund, you know, I, I think we need to link it to to funds in some way so that um, there's there is an incentive to do it. Well, I, I think, Director Lady, what you're saying speaks to how challenging this is through the entire conversation. And we talk about how things are voluntary. We talk about how we want to control our land use in our municipality or our county. That carrot and stick, it's challenging in terms of how you maintain that that autonomy to the local uh, community while also serving the, the the regional. And you know, I think one of my concerns is we say it's voluntary, but if we tie it to dollars, we got to be honest, it's not really voluntary at that point. So just part of the conversation that we'll we'll keep going. Uh, Director Dyack and Director Teal, I haven't forgot about you. We'll come to you after we get a couple more folks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, th this is this is one question that I, we didn't quite get to, and I'm under the wire uh, now getting to it. We had a Douglas County sub-regional meeting. Uh, it, it's it's probably more specific regarding the, the the greenhouse gas rule regarding waiver process. So to kind of walk through this, um, you know, if if we're doing the work to mitigate greenhouse gases, we're doing fantastic. Um, it gets to a point where there is a project that, that goes to the Transportation Commission for consideration that brings on the greenhouse gas um, and they approve it. Um, they, in effect, could potentially undermine the work that we're doing to try to mitigate that greenhouse gas. So to me, my question is, how, how, how would a waiver process um, approach um, work uh, with with something like that, and should Dr. Cog and the Dr. Cog board be considered that the Transportation Commission has the ability to approve or to not approve projects um, that that could create a greater burden on us to find mitigation strategies to meet the goals and objectives? So, and I think this might be a wrong question. I apologize, Jacob. 
Oh, I could answer it, but Ron, okay. if you... I don't care. I'm, I'm sure. good. <laughs> um, so I um, appreciate your question. Let me put a little bit of context around it, though. The waiver process is a very limited process, and I want, it, I want you all to understand um, what, it, what it could mean and, and when it would come into play. First of all, CDOT is still defining the actual mechanics of the waiver process, the form, the, the mechanism, the procedure to do it. Um, so parts of it are still undefined. But in the big picture, the idea is that we either meet the requirements of this rule by October 1st of this year, or we don't. If we meet the requirements of the rule, we're done for the time being. I mean, we'll come back eventually and revisit, but we're done. We don't need a waiver process. Doesn't come into play, we just go forward. If we don't meet the requirements of the rule by October 1st, then we get into a situation where there could be potential restriction on funds as I outlined in the presentation. If we get there, if we get there, then what happens is, if at that point there is a project that would otherwise be restricted according to the language of the rule, because it doesn't reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but you know, there's a project that, that we wanna bring forward, whether it's us or CDOT or another MPO, by the way, it's, it's agnostic. If there's a project that a project sponsor wants to bring forward that would otherwise be restricted, um, funds restricted because we didn't meet the requirements, then that's the only time the waiver process comes into play. It's for that particular project in that particular situation. It is not a general global waiver process. The Transportation Commission is not approving or waiving projects. Gotcha. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess the, the uh, hopefully we we achieve what we need to achieve by October. Um, you know, to me again, uh, that would that would have been my concern, uh, knowing what little I I know of that waiver process. That that kind of kind of concerned me because we're we're all trying to figure out how we can change our our communities, make decisions, and um, you know, if if somebody uh, could potentially undermine our our good work, I, I think that'd be challenging for me. But thank you very much for the for the response. Okay, thank you, Director Dyack. Director Shaw. I, I wanted to kind of help us step back just a moment because the past is- I'm having a hard time hearing you. I don't know if it, when I'm having a hard time hearing you, I don't know if anybody else is. I, uh, is this a little better? I'm a little closer? No? Oh, okay. No, that's so, better. Okay, good. So uh, I just wanted to um, take a moment to help us step back a little bit about the mitigations. And, uh, you know, there are things that, at least to me, make sense uh, to do when you have the opportunity to do them, whether or not, for example, a, a BRT route you know, it isn't always that you build it and they will come. Sometimes you just build it and they don't come. So I think over time, we're going to see how well these strategies pan out for us in, in the real world. And it'll be up to us to continue to, to do our best, um, to do the things that make sense, that, that may have... Uh, that may afford us the opportunity to uh, to to actually reduce our production of greenhouse gases. And so and that it, I think, you know, Jacob is you've probably said it before that, you know, we're kind of building the airplane while we're in midair. And I think that's very true. So um, I, I I would hesitate to go um, and and try and put restrictions this early in the game anyway. Um, and we may find that we don't need them, that there's enough common sense and enough opportunity throughout the region at, at uh, a, a large enough level to make a difference and to bear out the mitigation strategies as things that are working. So that's just my comment. But um, if we can step back a little, that's helpful. Thank you, Director Shaw. Director Teal. Thanks, Steve. Um, Want to dial back the clock a little bit about seven years ago. And back when Mayor Whitlow and Mayor Stoltzman were still council member Whitlow and Stoltzman. And and Steve, I think you were here at that time, and John Dyack, you definitely were. 
we had a we we would do this meeting at a time dedicated to the Metro Vision Committee, uh, something we all called MVIC. And um, change of governance did occur, but in the dying days of MVIC, we talked about taking the focus of Dr. Cog from this kind of enforcement mechanism, almost like a police station, to being more like the university, being the schoolhouse for um, you know, uh, metropolitan planning. Uh, not just for transportation planning, but even for our um, for our, our municipal planning. Oh, and by the way, I was on the Casra Council back in those days. And this idea that uh, this would be a place where knowledge could come together to be shared around the region and used for the betterment of the region. And so uh, kind of taking into uh, account some of the I think the voices we've heard in this conversation today in this meeting to you know, work as a region in order to compel our individual parts to specific action. I, I would also like us to always bear in mind, you know, all of us obviously have a regional focus or we wouldn't be here. But at the same time, we are locals in our, our own counties, our own municipalities. We are those who should be taking the work done here uh, back to our jurisdictions in order to um, provide that leadership for our colleagues. And so I, as we work through this process, I am confident we will likely adopt this plan that uh, Jacob and, uh, and Ron, uh, you have all done a very good job of presenting to us. I'm sure we're going to adopt it to be in compliance with uh, state regulations. I would all like us all to keep in mind that actually it's almost a clarion call. Our duty is certainly to come here, take our own views, our own individual agendas that compelled us to the table here, or the screen in this case, uh, to work together, but then to go home to our own individual boards, our own individual councils, and make sure that our own staffs are making use of these tools that I, I do hope, Doug, uh, you will take as direction, implied direction, to have the Dr. Cog staff develop for us to be used in our individual jurisdictions. Um, and then just finally, um, Ron, thanks so much, man. I, I owe you a 20, uh, obviously, for talking so well about Douglas County. Although uh, what you said is correct. Uh, I can assure you guys, uh, I've, I've seen few municipalities that have taken the bull by the horns nearly so much as Director Shaw and her fellow council members in terms of uh, working towards uh, transit options in uh, Douglas County, as well as the region. Thank you, sir. Very much appreciate it. And for clarification, I was not around when NVIC was going on. I think I came in right after that. Director Stoltzman. Thank you so much. Great conversation today. Um, I just would hope when staff comes back with what um, uh, Ron was talking about with the um, different orders of magnitude of reduction that we can expect to see from different measures. If we can also see um, rough costs, just order of magnitude costs associated with each measure, so we can understand the trade offs there. And then also in that same table, like showing what an equivalent cost of um, additional like EVs that you could buy straight up, just to show like, well, you could also spend this money on, on straight electrification um, of vehicles just so we can compare some different emission reduction scenarios and their relative cost. I know that just the work you were doing to come up with the emission magnitude will be hard, and I know the cost data won't be perfect, but I think having some order of magnitude in there will be really um, instructive. Thanks. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Stoltzman. Uh, quick question for staff. I know there have been some things in the chat that have not necessarily come up as a question here. Is the chat monitored? Do we have a way to, to respond to any of those questions that 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 weren't a part of the, the conversation here? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller? So, Mr. Chair, I'm looking at the chat just to make sure I just there, want to be sure we don't have something that's sitting there that, that wasn't responded to. I don't see any, Mr. Chair. There was a, a 
Let me see. There was a request for the link for this presentation that was included in the packet. Yeah. Okay. Great. Good. So if we're there, that's great. I just wanted to to be be sure before that you know goes away into never never land. So thank you very much. Any final questions, comments? Uh, uh, Jacob, Ron, Doug, anything that you want to get in there? Uh, Director Odoricio. Hey, everyone. I want to thank everyone for a vibrant dialogue and conversation today. I thought it was outstanding. We listened to different points of view. Um, and I do think I just want to keep iterating that some of the rest of the metro area is still growing. We just, I appreciate Dr. Cog recognizing that. We, uh, we're, we're still growing. We still have some capacity, but it doesn't have to be the way our grandparents did it. And so I think there's a win-win uh, to be found here uh, by doing it new ways, but also not stifling the growth and the opportunities that a lot of us have worked so hard to create. So I just want to say thank you for the dialogue. I appreciate uh, Dr. Cog's staff working on this and, and finding uh, ways for us to try to reduce greenhouse gas emissions while also allowing uh, growth in these growing communities, particularly on the outer rim of the metro area. Great points, thank you, and and so thankful for the very insightful questions and comments. Uh, Executive Director Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Uh, I might ask uh, Jacob or Ron if they might share just a little bit of what's next for, for the board, and and uh, I know we got some additional analysis that we need to do as a result of the, the news that we received a couple, three, a couple hours ago, but um, if you wouldn't mind just sharing. Sure. So with the standard caveats that things seem to change with this by the day, where we think we're heading with this is we're aiming to complete the technical work and the documentation by about the end of this month. We're planning for a 30-day public comment period, which is what we do every time we, we change the plan or, or amend this plan um, for a 30-day public comment period through the calendar month of August. Uh, public hearing the end of August, and then committee and board action in September to adopt the revised 2050 Regional Transportation Plan before October 1st. That action the board would take in September to adopt a revised plan would also include the two things that are required as part of the greenhouse gas rule, which is the greenhouse gas transportation report, which just kind of documents, you know, everything that we've been doing, everything we've been talking about, uh, the things that we've done, and presumably a mitigation action plan with mitigation measures, which is actually part of the GHG transportation report. So those things will come to you as a package. Again, presumably we're anticipating at your September board meeting uh, for action on the revised plan and associated documentation. Right. Thank you very much. Again, outstanding work by staff, outstanding questions and conversation. Thank you very much. Uh, our next uh, meeting is the board meeting on July 20th. Uh, look for information and packet and details on that. And then our next work session is on Wednesday, August 3rd. Man, this year is flying by. Thank you all so much. Everybody have a great night. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Good job. Thank you. Thank you.